And there was a hush in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why don't you stand on your feet this morning? How many are ready for the word today? What a great crowd in the middle of July in Clewiston, Florida. Amen. I was expecting about 10 people here today. Lord, help my faith. Amen. What a great crowd. How many are ready for the word? I sense the presence of the Lord here in a tremendous way today. And, and really, I say, I say uh, thank God for his presence, but that's, there's some people pushing through summer. That's why it's here today. There's some folks believing God for, to become a climate changer, for things to begin to change, not only in their own personal lives, but corporately. God, you're doing something here. I want to be a part of it. Amen. You could have stayed home today, slept in. And sat around the house and watched TV all day. But you said, God's doing something that's greater than my plans, my agenda, and what my body and my flesh want to do. And I want to be a part of it. So give yourself a hand this morning. <laughs> Amen. Well, that's weak. Give yourself a hand this morning. <laughs> no, I'm too humble to do that. Well, stay there then if you want to. Amen. Pastor Chuck and Karen are away this weekend, as you can see. They have been translated to Christ Central Live Oak in North Florida. Pastor Karen preached their women's conference last night. What a great opportunity for that. She preached their women's conference last night. And Pastor Chuck right now is shucking the corn right now at their 9 o'clock service. I think they have a 9 and 11 still. So he's going at it right now. He said, pray for me. Well, it's too late. He's already cut loose, I'm sure. But we're going to just lift them up and pray that God would use them to ch touch that church. Pastor Chuck, I think, has shared there one time before, did some prophetic teaching, preaching at their church, came and did some things for them and just kind of began to lay the groundwork for that church. It's a church, it's an offshoot of Pastor Lonnie Johns' church out of North Florida, and it's just another sister church of theirs. So it's a great, they're part of the network, the Destiny Network that we are a part of. So I believe it's important today, before we even get into the Word, to pray for our pastors today. Anytime they're away, anytime they're here, you need to cover your pastors in prayer. That is becoming more and more important to me as a as a member of the, this church and as a member of the body of Christ, you need to cover your leaders. Just turn on the media. It doesn't matter if they're secular, if they're political. Leaders are under attack. I don't care if you're good, bad, or ugly. They're all under attack. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? Leadership, people with influence, people that are making a difference, people that have a mandate to do something, to establish something, whether it be politically, whether it be economically, whatever it is, anybody that has a desire to impact and lead people and change people and facilitate people's dreams and desires. Those people are under attack. So we're going to cover our pastors today. You need to, whether it's just a three-word sentence, bless my pastor. Do it on a daily basis. Just, Father, cover our pastors. Cover them. Plead the blood of Jesus over them. So we're going to pray for them. We're going to get into the word today. I've got a word for you today. I've got a word. Amen. Amen. Vanessa was holding Roman, and she said, we prayed for you last night. And I said, I could tell. Last night I did not have a word, and today I have a word. Your prayers have been answered. No, I have been believing, just studying, listening to what God says. Kim and I have been away, and our family have been away the last couple of weeks on vacation. And I couldn't get, a, I couldn't get away from just one thought. And I thought it was just for me, uh, dream-wise, personally. But, man, I felt the Holy Ghost continue to say something to me over and over as I was, as I was away, as I would... Uh, just meditate on the Word of God and just had some time alone fishing. I just felt the Holy Spirit continue to say something over and over in my spirit. I just want to stay in the same vein. We're still talking about climate change, but let's pray for our pastors. We're going to get in the Word, and then we're going to see the Holy Spirit touch some people. And this church is going to go to another level. How many believe that today? In the middle of July, we're going to see an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Pastor Chuck said we had a tremendous service last Sunday. Amen. That's because you came, amen, and you believe God that he's doing something in the midst of New Harvest Church. So let's pray. Let's cover our pastors this morning. Father, today we just thank you for Pastor Chuck and Karen, the opportunity they have today to minister to Christ Central Live Oak this morning and be a blessing to that church. We just thank you for the opportunity today. Father, I just pray that even after the preaching of the word today, you're going to open doors for them to really touch lives and touch people today. I thank you that they're instilling and installing and imparting something even to that pastoral and that leadership team of that church. What a great opportunity. And, Father, I just declare those opportunities are going to become more and more frequent. 
the doors of ministry, even to other nations and other parts of the world, are going to continue to open to them because they carry a, a mantle and a mandate not only to bless this region, but to take what God's doing here and to release it around the world. Now, thank you for that today. So, Father, today we cover them. We plead the blood of Jesus over them today in Jesus' name to keep, provide, restore, and refresh today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 If you've got your Bibles today, I want to stay on the topic talking about climate changers. How many believe that's been a word for this house? Let me say that one more time. How many believe that's been a word for this house? But the thing we need to understand about climate change is this. It's not just an option for us to be able to do. It's not like, well, we're a strong worship church. Well, we're a real strong climate change church. The entire body of Christ has been mandated to be a climate changer. And if you don't sense that as a believer personally and corporately as a church, if you don't sense that, you've really got to back all the way up and say, what happened to me when I got saved? Because when I became a believer... When I became born again, the Bible says that all of heaven filled me. All of heaven filled me, came inside of me. The Bible says about me that greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. The Bible says about me, I am the salt and the light of the earth. Come on. The Bible says about me, if God be for me, who can be against me? In other words, I'm, I need to be doing something. If God be for what I need to be doing, who can be against what I need to be doing? We've been mandated to be climate changers, to be people that no matter where we go, on your job, in your house, in your home, in your business, at Walmart, shopping, fishing, hunting, wherever you are, wherever you go, the existing climate has got to change. And if it is not changing, now a lot of us think, well, we need to change the climate. We need to see some certain things begin to stop happening, crime, hate racism. Those things are never going to go away. Jesus said this. He said, the poor you're always going to have with you. Struggling people you're always going to have with you. So if we're looking to create a utopia where everything is perfect, we are going to miss the mark. So we're not here to make everything perfect. We're here to lift up a climate that's greater than the existing climate. Wish I could get some help in this church today. We're not here to change Cluston, change all the people, change the current system. We're here to lift up a climate that overpowers the current climate. Hallelujah. We're here to lift up a greater climate. We are climate creators. So I don't walk into my job and expect everybody to be meditating on the things of God. I don't care if that happens or not. On my job, I do care if it happens at church. I hope you're praying and reading your Bible. But on my job, I'm not there to make everybody stop cussing, stop doubting, stop getting sick. I'm not there to do that. But I am there to come in and say, hey, you know what? These things are always going to be happening around me. But I'm here to lift up a greater climate so that when their eyes are open, they've got something to turn to. See, a lot of people today, I, I still got to read. You doing okay? I got a long time. See, a lot of people today are getting discouraged because things around them are not changing. Your focus is all wrong. You're not there to change that. You're there to lift up a greater kingdom so that when they do decide to change, they've got somewhere to turn to. Hallelujah. So today I want to talk to you about climate changers what does it look like, and how do I get there? Amen. Because New Harvest Church, we can't just say, man, God's got a mandate on New Harvest Church to, be, to change the climate here. Hopefully the Baptist Church has a mandate to be climate changers. Hopefully the Methodist Church, the Catholic Church, all of the believers in the Glades region have a mandate to change the climate. And we do that by lifting up a greater climate. Jesus said this, no man goes into a strong man's house and takes his goods until he first ties up the strong man. So we're not here to do away with the strong man. We're here to tie him up by lifting up a greater power and a greater kingdom. Hallelujah. Amen. So even in our own lives personally, how many realize we've all got things that we struggle with? And a lot of us won't take a step for God until we clean up our act. 
How many of you have ever felt like that? No, I can't do that, but i got to clean up my act. you got to do the same thing. You, sometimes you got to step into what God has for you while you're still kind of off kilter. Amen. Peter became the greatest apostle known to man at the time when the 12 were still circulating in the earth. He was the leader of the pack. He became the first pope, if you want to say it. But you know what? He stepped out and did some powerful things while he still took hold of a crutch called racism. And he finally learned that, hey, this gospel is for everybody. But sometimes you've got to lift up a greater kingdom to overpower the current kingdom that's in your life so that you can step out and do something for God. It's not perfect people that are changing the world. It's people that have learned their identity in Christ. Amen. In Christ, I can do all things through. Let me say that again. I can do all things through who strengthens me. In other words, I can do all things once I get my act together. No, I can do all things once I find my identity in Christ. Nothing's too difficult difficult for me. Hallelujah. It's a good day. Somebody say it's a good day. Turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 2. Climate change. What does it look like and how do I get there? Is there a water? Thank you. Thank you. And there was a voice from the crowd that said, look ye behind ye. Let me get a shot of water so I don't sound like alfalfa when I read. Hallelujah. Acts 2.42. Who's got it? Okay, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone, somebody say everyone. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And all the believers were together, had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. And every day, somebody say every day, not just Sunday. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's what climate change looks like. That's what climate change looks like. That's what it looks like when the body of Christ begins to understand who they are and what they've been called to do. It's not just an outreach. It's not just a fad that they're following. It's simply responding to the outpouring of heaven down on the inside of them, and this is what should happen naturally through the life of a believer in a body of Christ. Somebody say amen. Let's pray, and then you can be seated. Father, we thank you for your presence today. We thank you for the word of God today. We thank you for the atmosphere that's here today. I thank you for what you're doing at New Harvest Church. Help me be an asset to that. Help me help promote that and continue to push what you're trying to establish in this house and in this region. And I thank you for it today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 You can be seated this morning. I wrote my notes out this morning real big so I wouldn't need my glasses. Amen. But we have been called and mandated to be climate changers. Climate creators. There is a greater climate. There is another climate. We have winter, spring, summer, and fall. We have tropics. We have northern climates, southern climates, rain climates. There is a greater climate. There is a greater climate, and it can be established by people who simply grab a hold of the Word of God. Somebody say the Word of God. Because our ability, let me just start by saying this to you this morning, our ability to affect change personally or or corporately depends on our ability to take the Word of God from seed to harvest. Let me say that again. Our ability to affect climate personally. How many realize you got a personal climate? 
you've got a cloud over your head. You, you ever heard that? Man, I feel like I walk around and i got a dark cloud over my head. There's a climate that follows you everywhere you go. The Apostle Paul calls it the aroma of Christ. There, there should be a climate that follows you personally wherever you go. I'm thankful for the corporate climate we sense in this place this morning. It brings life. It brings encouragement. It brings hope. You sense the fellowship of the believer's love, and you sense the, des- the, the desire of the people to grow and, and passionate about the things of God. But you carry a personal climate too. And what begins to affect a region is when my personal climate comes in contact with your personal climate, and our personal climates come in contact with somebody else, and all of a sudden you begin to create an atmosphere that's greater than the current atmosphere. Amen. See, early believers, and even in America with the move of uh, the, 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 the Mormons moving to Utah out of the northeast, you see these people looking for utopia. we got to get somewhere where there's nothing that challenges what I believe, nothing that stands against the things I believe about God. So we're going to move out to Utah, isolate ourselves from any other kind of influence or or derogatory words, or anything that may contradict the way we believe, and then we'll be successful. We were not created to isolate ourselves away from mankind. We were made to live in the midst of hell and release heaven. Amen. The power that was released from Calvary when Jesus said, it is finished, when I put my faith in, it is finished There comes an ability down on the inside of me to stand in the midst of the worst kind of trouble that I could ever imagine and still come out victorious. See, there's a lot of people, and we do it all the time. Anytime our faith is challenged, we want to run. But God says, I've not enabled you and equipped you and called you to run. I've called you to be greater than what you're facing. So I don't have to run. I just have to say, God Where am I lacking that I'm not able to get victory over this current situation? We were not created to be runners. We were created to be changers. We were created to be winners. We were created to be conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Say that with me. We are more than conquerors. I've never heard of a conqueror who never had a battle. Hallelujah. We are more than conquerors. Why? Because I've never faced anything before. No, you're more than conquerors because there's nothing hell can throw at you that you cannot get victory over. Well, I just got this thorn in my side that I cannot shake. You know what? That's not there to keep you defeated. It's probably there maybe to keep you humble in the case of the Apostle Paul. Hallelujah. Well, I just can't shake this habit. The Bible says that on Calvary, Jesus nailed everything that was against us to the cross. There is nothing in Christ that can keep you from living a full, satisfying, powerful life in God. Well, I would have run on that one. Nothing in life. Well, you just don't know my parents... You know, that's why Jesus said, honor your father and mother. As soon as I honor my parents, no matter how they raised me, what they put me through, no matter what they did, as soon as I honor them, I break the power that they released in my life to limit me. As soon as I say, I love you because Jesus loved me when I was unlovable, I love you, I honor you, I'm going to stop talking bad about you, thinking bad about you, believing bad about you, talking bad about you, suffering the results of what you said about me. As soon as you honor them and say, man, thank you. Maybe you weren't the best parents, but you brought me into this world and gave me an opportunity to live for God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And as soon as you honor them, you break the power of generational curses and you can become anything that God has put in your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things. Nothing's too hard. Nothing's too difficult. Nothing can stop me. 
No weapon formed against me can prosper. Hallelujah. And every tongue that rises against me shall be vindicated, for this is my inheritance in Christ. Somebody say amen. But our ability to take something from seed to harvest depends on what we're doing with the Word of God. And I had a discussion with somebody this week. You know what? American church, I can't talk for Africa. I can't talk for Europe. I can't talk for any other. And um, the American church is suffering biblically. You know, I could stand up here and say, you know what? Jesus was hanging out with the Easter Bunny, and a lot of people would say, awesome. You know what I'm saying? The Easter Bunny came out on Easter and laid some eggs, and Jesus said, that's awesome. I'm going to do the same thing and die for your sins. Amen. And people go, hallelujah. Because you know what? We are a biblically illiterate nation. Not only the sense that we don't know the word, but nobody is even hungry for the word of God anymore. California is trying to kick the word out. Hallelujah. And California needs the word more than anybody. We need the word of God because my success as a believer, as a church, depends on my ability to take the Word of God, take it from seed form. The Word always starts in seed form and produce a harvest over here called climate change. So number one, I've got to love the Word. How many love the Word of God today? Job said this about the Word of God. He turned to God before he had trouble. And I'm thankful that he said it after he had trouble. But before he had all of Job's trials, we call them, he turned to God and said, God, I desire your word more than my daily hamburger. I desire your word more than my daily food. I'm telling you, if America could get there, we'd lose weight and we would grow spiritually. Hallelujah. That's Job's health plan. Love God's word more than you like to eat. I lost y'all on that one. Got to reel you back in. But Job said, I have loved your word more than my daily food. Here's God's response. I'm going to kill your kids. I'm going to make you sick. Because... It wasn't that God was just testing that. Of course, we know the whole backstory on that. Satan said, look, take every, all of his stuff away, and he'll curse you. And God said, I don't think he will, because he made one statement to me one time before. I desire your word above my daily food. And anybody that has that kind of devotion, dedication, and love for my word can make it through anything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many brought your Bible to church today? How many brought an old school Bible? One with pages, not with swipes. How many brought an old school? I'm not saying you're better than anybody else, but hopefully, how many brought some kind of word? Lift your hand, get it up. You got some kind of Bible, some kind of something on you. We have got to come into the house of God. You know, we come for the show, we come for the lights, the sound. We come for the aura of the atmosphere. We come for that. I didn't have anything else to do this morning. We come for the um, pat on the back or to ease a little bit of guilt. We come for the religious reasons. But how many came today to sit in an atmosphere and to get a word from God so that I could take that word and take it from seed form and bring it over here through the time of process and create something out of it? How many came for that today? How many came today to be changed by the glory of God? How many came today to become something greater than where you were before? How many came today because you know God, when he saved you, he called you, and he put a path in front of you that's going to require something in you that's greater than where you are right now? Hallelujah. We're going somewhere. We're going someplace. And when we go there, we're going to change the climate. You know what? I began to think about being a climate changer and this came into my thinking, and then I began to meditate on it a little bit. But you know what? Apparently, God wants us to change the climate because he wants to grow something here that cannot grow in the existing climate. Now, we've stood for years and declared, man, this is going to be a, this is going to be a house of miracles. Miracles are just going to be uh, just a continual basis. How many have heard that word? 
That's something God wants to grow here, and it cannot grow here under the existing climate. So we've got to change the climate so it can become conducive to what God wants to do. Somebody say amen. God wants to grow a peach tree here, but this is not the climate. He wants us to create a climate that can grow a peach tree. Healing, miracles, signs and wonders, an outpouring of the Holy Ghost that's never been experienced like it has been in the past here in the Glades region. He wants to grow something that does not exist here now because if the climate was okay and what's growing here was okay, he would not change the climate. Amen. If orange trees were okay, palm trees were okay, oak trees were okay, they're all good and beautiful, hallelujah, apply shade and everything, but God says, you know what? I want to throw something else that's never been in that mix before. And you're going to have to lift up a climate that's greater than the existing one so I can release it in that area. Amen. Signs and wonders, an outpouring of heaven, your miracle is waiting for a climate change. Now, Jeff Davis is here on the front row, walked through a tremendous battle physically. How many realize, now I I haven't really talked to him in detail about all the things that he went through and the things that he had to do, but I'm 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 probably pretty positive as soon as he got the news, you've got cancer. And it's not looking too good for you. I guarantee you he did not go on with his current schedule. I believe some things changed. I believe some people changed. I believe some things around the house changed. Can't say that no more. Can't think that no more. Can't believe that no more. I bet some revelation about healing changed. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? Why? He had to create a climate in his life that would become conducive to receive healing. Amen. You know what? That most people that go to a Benny Hinn meeting get healed before they walk through a prayer line. Why? Because he's really a worship leader and he knows how to create an atmosphere that is conducive for people to release their faith and believe God for a miracle. That's why they stand in that prayer line and go, when I was standing in the audience... Something came over me. I received a word. No more for you. Sickness is gone. You've been delivered. You're healed. And immediately something happened. What happened? Was it Benny Hinn? No, Benny Hinn just created an atmosphere and a climate for somebody to rise up and experience a new climate that they could grow something they could not grow before. See, a lot of people are trying to grow something in a climate that is not conducive for it, and they're getting frustrated, they're quitting, and they're throwing in the towel. Well, I came to church. I came to church, and nothing happened. How many of you have ever heard that? Man, I came one Sunday, came to your church, you invited me, and nothing changed in my life. Nothing happened. I'm telling you something. One church visit will not change a climate in your life. I came to church. Nothing happened. You got to get somewhere where the climate is different on a continual basis. So, in other words, it's not, I came to church, I came to Christ. Let me say that again. It shouldn't be, I came to church, it should be, I came to Christ. Because Jesus is the only one that can change a climate. Oh, let me say that again. Jesus is the only one that can change a climate. A church cannot change the climate. Ooh, let me say that again. A church cannot change the climate. Oh, we need better worship to change the climate. No. We need better lights. We need better children's ministry. We've used that excuse so many years, it's not even funny. We need better ushers. We need a better pastor to change the climate. No. No. My church is not the answer for my life. Hallelujah. This is good preaching. Amen. The church is not the answer for my life. So it's not I came to church and nothing changed. So when I came to church, I didn't just come to some program and some some organization that might have the answer for me. The only thing that changed my life is when I came to Christ. Amen. Church will not change a person. Church is for changed people. Hallelujah. 
That's why people that come to an altar, I could count thousands of people that came to an altar, got saved, and they never came back. They're not here. Who knows where they are? Because coming to a church, answering an altar call will not change you. The only thing that will change us is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. The only thing that will change us is a relationship with Jesus Christ. So people that sit around and go, man, my pastor, man, our worship, man, our song, I, man, I just, he's too old timey, he's too modern, he's too contemporary. None of that matters when you get a relationship with Christ. Because it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Not an on fire church, the hope of glory, but Christ in me is Jesus in you. Amen. Is Jesus in us? Do we have a relationship with Jesus? I don't care if you answered an altar call. I don't care if the hair on the back of your neck went up when there was an altar call and you came forward and answered it. Did you start a relationship with Jesus? Amen. There's good people here. There's bad people here. Well, the church is just full of hypocrites. So what? It's full of liars and cheats, deceivers. So what? That is not the answer for your life. The answer is a living, breathing relationship. Jesus down on the inside to the point that you know that the issue of blood has left your body. When I came to Jesus, I know something was broken. When I came to Jesus, I know the old was gone and behold, everything was new. When I became a Christian, amen, things changed in my life. And you know what? That simple truth will get you to day one and to day 10,000. Oh, that's just in elementary. That's what kept me going yesterday. It's what kept me going today. What got me up here today was not, man, I hope I studied enough. I didn't study any for this. Amen? I looked up a couple of scriptures. It was already in me. I'm not making this up. Amen? Well, I hope I studied enough. hope I prayed enough. No, the only thing that's going to impart anything to you that's going to change your life is what Jesus has done in me. So if I get up here and try to talk about eschatology when Jesus is coming back and he's not taught me that and instructed me in that and I don't have a revelation in it, it might as well be me throwing a brick at you. Amen? It's going to be heavy and it's going to hurt. And it's going to, be a, and it's going to leave a mark. Not a good mark. Amen? So we've got to understand that it's a a relationship with Jesus. Paul said, everything else I've thrown away, except for this one truth, Christ and him crucified. Hallelujah. Christ and him crucified. Somebody say, give me that old-time religion. Sometimes we need some old-time religion. It's nothing but Jesus. See, I know that doesn't that doesn't gel with this current. It's Jesus and some hopping music. It's Jesus and a good youth program. It's Jesus and a good Bible study. It's Jesus and I'm telling you something. When the church gets satisfied with just Jesus, we'll make an impact. When Jesus is the center of my joy, I'll make an impact. When Jesus is the reason for my season, I'll make an impact. Somebody say amen. But we must become producers. Somebody say producers. We are either producers or consumers. 
Let me say that again. We are either producing something or we're consuming. I need, I need, I need. Anybody ever said, watch what about Bob? I need, I need, I need. I need. But we're either producing or consuming, one or the other. Producing or consuming. I told you our ability to change the climate is going to depend on our ability to take the seed and turn it into a harvest. Take the seed and turn it into a harvest. So we must become producers because we are either producers or consumers. Now listen to me. Consumers never change anything. Let me say that again. Consumers never change anything. And that's all the Holy Spirit kept saying to me over and over and over again while I was on vacation. I couldn't get away from it. You must become producer. You've got to be a producer. You've got to be a producer. You've got to produce something. If you're going to change something, you've got to have a producer mentality. Because a consumer never changes anything. People that say it's all about me, it's all about what I need, it's all about what's coming this way versus what's going that way, they'll never change anything. They'll never make an impact on anything. Consumers never change anything. Now, they can complain about everything, but they'll never change anything. How many know the person I'm talking about? Come on, how many know somebody like that? They complain about everything. Oh, it's service is so slow. They're so slow here. Can't get any service here. They never know anything. They can't have anything. Push is just so small. Nowhere they eat. This region is just so messed up. Uh, U.S. Sugar controls and, and, and just make, controls everything. If you don't work for U.S. Sugar, you can't do anything around. Complain, 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 complain. Consumers can complain. The best complainers are consumers. They can complain about everything, but they never take a step to change it. Complaining is not changing. You will not change anything by complaining. Producers find an answer. Consumers find an argument. How many know what I'm talking about? Producers, if they hear something, if they hear a problem, they'll begin immediately to work on an answer. A consumer will immediately look for somebody who thinks the same way that they think about it. Producers hang out with producers. Consumers hang out with consumers. I tell you what, we could, we could, we could take this group of people right here, put us in a room just like we are right now for a couple of hours, and I guarantee you eventually the producers would be in a section and the consumers would be in a section. Amen. Birds of a feather, what? Complain together. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? Birds of a feather flock together. Producers will hang out with producers. You don't even have to ask. Just give us a couple hours together. The complainers will find the complainers. Boy, he went way too long today. Yes, he did. Hallelujah. Producers will say something like this. Man, that was a word today. That spoke right to me, man. I'm going to go home right now. I'm going to get in that word. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, brother, you ain't joking. That hit me right between the eyes. God's talking to me. Complainers will say, man, he's way too hard. He's way too tough. And they'll congregate. Nothing personally. They'll congregate. And then your producers will get together. How do we take this church to another level? How do we implement that? What do I need to do? Pastor Gatton, how do I get involved make that happen? How do I get involved in this church to take that word about climate change from a seed form and really make it manifest in the earth? Come on, somebody say amen. That's a producer. Consumer says, I don't like Pastor Gatlin's Hawaiian shirt this morning. <laughs> that, church, that shirt just threw me off. It's really not Hawaiian. It's just extremely feminine. 
Just joking, man. You know I love you. Through many toils and trials. Hey, Amen. Boy, that shirt, I just could not get past that shirt. I came in with full expectation for, to receive my miracle when I saw that shirt. It was gone. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? That's a complainer. Hallelujah. Producer comes in and says, I don't care if Pastor Gatlin is wearing one of those shirts that looks like he's wearing a tuxedo. Doesn't matter to me. Hallelujah, because I realize that where I need to get does not depend on what Pastor Gatlin is wearing, doing, saying, worshiping. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? For me to get what God has put down on the inside of my heart, I simply got to take the seed, live it out, and produce a harvest. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. That's good stuff. Some of y'all are going, I can't wait for Pastor Chuck to get back. But let me read this, and I want to read the scripture. Go ahead and start turning in your Bible to Matthew 13. I don't like to give away a scripture because immediately everybody starts going to my next point before I finish the last one. But let me finish that with this. We either must be producers. We're either going to be producers or consumers. God's calling us to be producers. Producers. And producers don't become producers by complaining so much. Production does not come out of criticism. Production comes out of a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Producers find an answer. Consumers find an argument. And if we're going to change a climate, we must become producers. Somebody say producers. Turn in your Bible if you're not already there. Matthew 13. Hallelujah. How many are glad you came to church today? Matthew 13, beginning of verse number one. That same day, now I could do a backstory on this and it would bring a little more light to this, but contextually it really won't matter. So I did study a little bit. I lied earlier. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large, cra such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it with all the pe while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things and parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some, of, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. And still other seed fell on good soil where it produced, somebody say produced, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. And the disciples came to him and asked, why did you speak to the people in parables? Let me say something first about climate change. One thing we need to understand, if we're going to lift up a climate that's greater than the existing climate, how many realize that's going to make the existing climate extremely unhappy? How many have ever heard this in your life? How many are native Floridians? Made, come on, get man, we're being outnumbered. The South will rise again. Anybody here native Floridians? Hallelujah. Native Floridians here. How many have ever heard anybody say, in Florida, live in Florida, man, I hate the heat. Anybody ever heard anybody say that? Let me say that. I hate the heat. Not everybody's going to be happy with the climate. Amen. Let me say this. If you're taking notes, write this down. Climate change, whether personally or corporately, is messy. If we're thinking we're going to create a climate where everybody is happy, we're going to miss the mark. Because the climate God wants to create that's greater than the existing climate, just that fact alone is going to stir a lot of people up. But if we create the climate that God wants to have here, it's going to be messy. It's going to be messy personally. You're going to have to get messy. So if you're looking for it to be sweet and easy and just a walk in the roses, you're going to miss it. You'll never make the path to production or climate change without facing a few messes. 
Amen. Now, how many realize there are good messes and there are bad messes? Bad messes are the ones we create because of our sin and our rebellion against God. That's a bad mess. But there are some good messes. How many ate dinner last night and your wife cooked for you? Never. All right. Uh, what TV series can I bring up where a wife cooked and a husband ate? Dishes had to be cleaned and stuff had to be put away. Hey, I'll go back to what about Bob? Remember the kitchen scene when they're in there laughing and singing and they're cleaning dishes? Remember that? Singing in the rain. Remember that? Y'all need to get out more. It's a clean movie. It's got a great story. It'll lead you to the cross. Maybe not. What about Bob? They're in the kitchen cleaning up dishes, laughing, having a good time. But they enjoyed a meal right before that. But you know what? Somebody had to cook, dirty up some pots, dirty up some plates. Amen? Even Burger King. They got a mess back there. How many have ever worked at Burger King? You had to stay on the shift to clean up. You know what I'm saying? A mess had to be made. But that was a good mess. Why? Because it provided food and took care of your hunger. Amen. Are we on the same page? Not if we are. Not off if we're not. Amen. Thank you, Miguel. But some messes are bad and some are good. There are some good messes. Now, they don't look good at the time. You go, man, I really offended that person. But if it was a mess made for the sake of creating a greater climate, the end result will be their salvation. Now, I'll say that maybe, maybe not. But now at least there's a greater light release so that they can be exposed to the love of God. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? So, would you risk offending somebody and possibly sending them to hell or risk offending somebody and possibly creating an avenue where they could respond to the gospel? Either way, you're going to step on some toes. Climate change is messy, personally and corporately. Amen. So if you're looking to be beautiful and pretty in your walk with salvation and walking with Jesus, the Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. To me, that says it's going to be messy. It's going to get ugly. It's going to get challenging. It's going to get to the point where you want to throw in the towel. But work it out. Look at somebody and say, work it out. Quit being a baby. Amen. How many realize you don't make babies go to work? Roman, get out there and earn something. Pay your debt of society around here. You sorry one-year-old. You know what? Babies don't work. Real people are not afraid of work. The lazy man says, oh, I can't go to work. Why? There's a lion in the street. Brr, brr. My boss is Mr. Paul Hill. Mr. Paul Hill, there's a lion out in my front yard. I can't come to work today. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? I'm afraid of working. But work out your salvation. How many realize on your job it gets messy sometimes? Come on. Characteristics run into each other. People run into each other. Personalities run into each other. What do you do, quit? Oh, I'm looking for a better job. No, you're looking for a box in the hills. Come on. Grow up. Learn to say, I'm sorry. Learn to say, I forgive you. Learn to say, you know what? We've all got to learn earn an income here. I'm not here just to aggravate you. I did not get up at 5 in the morning just to show up here to be a pain in your neck. I came here to earn an income, to get increase, to pay my tithes, Pastor Chuck. You hear what I'm saying? I didn't show up here just to be a pain in your neck. You know what? I hope as Christians we don't live just to make somebody mad. But I showed up here to get an income. And I know I want to do it this way and you want to do it that way. But whichever way, it doesn't matter as long as we continue to get an income and continue to produce what we're here to produce. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Growing up 101, don't be a consumer on your job. Amen. How many have ever, ever been in that circle of consumers and you heard somebody say, man, today, all eight hours, I didn't do nothing. <laughs> and they say that like, ta 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 I did nothing, absolutely nothing today. Ain't I awesome? No, you're a consumer. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? But producers will say, you know what? They'll, they'll look at it and go, you know what? This little argument, hey, man, I forgive you. We're going to get past this thing if I did something to hurt you. And it's not like, oh, yeah, but he's the one that did the wrong. It doesn't matter. You want to keep the ship going. You want to keep the ship afloat. Whatever it takes. This, me winning this argument is not going to is not going to help promote things here. It's going to keep things on a back seat. Hey, Pastor Gatlin, I love your shirt. I would wear that. What size is that? <laughs> Amen. I just don't like short sleeve. Please forgive me. But do you understand what I'm saying? You don't want to be a consumer in a producing environment. Amen. Hallelujah. You should go to work saying, you know what? My job is to build hamburgers. I produce hamburgers. That's what I'm here to do today. I'm here to satisfy people's needs for a hamburger. Now, I know this is simple. Whatever you do, hopefully you're producing something. You're producing something. You've got to come in with that mindset. I'm here to produce something. Because as soon as a consumer gets in the mix... They don't care if a hamburger gets made or not. Consumers want to be promoted without earning it. You ever see anybody like that? Man, tell you what, you hire these young people today and they say, when do I get my BMW? I'm like, dude, you've only been here a week. You know? They want to drive what the big bosses are driving. And they've not done what it takes to get there. Hallelujah, I know I'm preaching to this society now. People want promotion without earning it. That's consumers, man. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hey, man, I got my first paycheck. When do I become the VP? You, you know what I'm saying. I've, I've earned it. No, you can't even barely, you don't even have keys to the building yet. <laughs> consumers, consumers, we're consumers. And I'm telling you something. There's a spirit. If, I don't, if you don't hear anything today, hear this. There is a spirit in America today that wants to make us consumers rather than producers. Why is America the youngest nation in the world, but yet the most powerful? Because we are producers more than we're consumers. We are full of people that will say, you know what? I don't have time to eat right now. I've got an idea about this invention right now, and I'm going to focus on it right now. That's why you have the, the Fords and the Edisons. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? That's why you have the Bill Gateses. That's why you have people that produce something that changes the world and puts America on the map. But there's a spirit that says, you know what? Producers are bad. Capitalism is bad. Having an idea is bad. Wanting to improve things is bad. You just need to be a consumer and take, 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 take. But as soon as I got saved... The Jesus down on the inside of me said, go into all the world and make something. Man, I wish I could get some help right there. Go into all the world and produce something. We are producers. Look at somebody and say, we are producers. We are producers. Change depends on what we do with the word of God. Change, let me say that again. Change depends on what we do with the Word of God. Now, I brought me up, you know, I've always got to have something. I talked about Gatlin's sh shirt, now I've got to carry a purse. It's not a purse. Thank you, it's a man bag. Change depends on what we do with the Word. What are you doing with the word? I don't know. I read it yesterday. And what are you doing with it? How did it speak to you? 
Or do we put other people's faith? Well, I know somebody who needs that word. Projection will not implement change. But as soon as I say, man, that's me. That's me. That's a word for me. That's the first thing you've got to do with the word. Make it personal. Write that in your notes. If it never becomes personal, it will never change. I don't care if it's personally or corporately. If the word of God does not become personal first, it will not become world changing. Jesus in me, the hope of glory. It's got to become personal. Now, I read to you Matthew 13. And it's talking about the Jesus begins to share, show the, share the parable about the sower. And I told you that, now, Melissa, I'm going to give you a heads up here. You might want to get your vacuum cleaner right now. I told you climate change is messy. Somebody say messy. Climate change is messy. If we want to be known as the pretty church, we'll never change the climate. The nice church, the church for all people, we're not going to be for all people. That's a lie. If you ever see a church that says a church for all people, it, it ain't. Not everybody is going to grab a hold of the vision here. Not everybody's going to move to the producing crowd at New Harvest Church. Amen. I mean, they may be here, but climate change is messy. And Jesus begins to share about the parable about the sower. And he's talking to his disciples right after a situation where the Pharisees were really trying to draw away what Jesus was there to do. And he really kind of brings their focus back to this one point. When it's all said and done, fellas, this whole thing is going to come down to when you go to heaven and God looks at you and either says, well done or not. Either he says, well done, it's all going to depend on this. What you did with the word. What kind of impact did the word of God have on you? Jesus is the word made flesh. So we could say it this way. What did you do with the Jesus in you? I don't, I don't care if, you know. What did you do with the Jesus in you? So he, you know, I don't think he did an illustration. I'm one up on Jesus. But they lived in this society. Oh, man. Prop failure. Not crop failure. Prop failure. Hold my microphone. Producers come up with an answer. Complainers complain about the people that help make this. <laughs> Let me say that again. Consumers complain about the people that help them. Producers just find an answer. Ta-da! Good as new. Actually, it has more retail value now because it has character. <laughs> but now, I'm still in control. Jesus said the sower took his seed and began to sow his seed. Now, you've got to get out of our mentality now. We got machines run by GPS. Come on, let's go back about 2,500 years and get in the context. We do it by machine now, and I mean, they know exactly where just about every seed goes. But the funny thing is, I work in the ag industry, and 
the people that do a lot of the corn planting, now we don't have, we have cane seed, but it's, it's another story. Let me do corn and beans. And even in today's technology, those guys will back up to my dock to get chemical or whatever. And there's corn seed all in the back of that truck, bean seed all in the back of that truck. So still the context applies, even in great technology today, we can still apply it. Some of the seed, some of the word of God is going to end up where it was not intended to. Amen. Even in our great country of America. So he says, the sower begins to sow the seed. Now he's standing in a field. He's getting out of his truck. He's getting out of his wagon. He's getting off of his mule, whatever. And some falls on the, on the road. Whoops. You know, and he, he may have had prop failure. I mean, he may have a hole in his bag. You know what I'm saying? So... Some of the seed is going to fall where it was not intended to fall. It fell on the road. Yeah, Melissa, I, I intentionally got, some people are mad because it's falling on the floor and they got to clean it up. And some people are going, man, what kind of beans are them, man? I could throw them in a crock pot with some ham hock and we could have lunch. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? So the sower, some falls out of the bag. You know, it wasn't his intention. Let me throw some on the road because later on Jesus is going to need a parable to some guy. You know, you see what I'm saying? So he's getting off his mule. Some falls on the road. Um, he's maybe trying to pour it into another bag and it's falling on the ground. And uh, so he's immediately got some on the road. Somebody say the road. So he's got some on the road. And then the Bible says he continues to throw. I'm trying to, I'm trying to limit it and keep it on the carpet. So some, he moves on from there, and the Bible says he continues to sow. And in the field, he's trying to get some of the seed in. There's some rocky ground. I'll tell you what, there's some fields around here that, how many have seen those fields they plow, and I mean, it's black. I mean, it's solid black. But then you got some fields that got some rock in them. They don't say, oh, that's got a rock in it. We can't plant there. No, they just, we know it's got some rocks. It's not going to be the best, but there's some good soil in there, too. All right, so, but he sows some, and just because it's got rocks in it, he didn't throw the baby out with the bath water. He says, there's still good soil there, so I'm not going to let that good soil that's mixed in with the rocks miss out. But he keeps sowing, and uh, he continues to sow, and he continues to reach in his bag and grab more seed, even though some he knows, he, he's been around long enough, that, that ain't. That ain't going to grow. That's bird feed. He knows. He doesn't stop and go, oh, man, I messed up. Drop some on the road. It's not going to produce, so I got to quit. That's the person that says, man, until I get my life together and don't drop any on the road, I can't go. But he goes to the next level and drops some, and it falls among rocks. And he knows, man, that one seed there, man, it fell right on that rock. But I got to keep going. I can't stop. I got to keep going because... I know there's some good soil out there somewhere. I'm going to keep going. And he keeps going, and he gets to part of the field where they didn't get all the weeds and the thorns out, but he throws some out anyway. Amen? Aren't you glad Jesus threw some out on you anyway? How many have ever received a word when you were messed up? Oh, man, let me say that again. Aren't you glad Jesus will sow some seed even though he knows there's some problems in your life? Hallelujah. Why does he do that? Because he knows it's the word that will bring you out of it. If you can just take one seed, even if it's the size of a mustard seed and produce something, it'll give you the encouragement to say, hey, I can deal with that. I can't get them rocks out of my life. But he gets to a part of the field that's got some thorns in it. And he doesn't stop. He probably says, you know what? Man, I know what's going to happen here, but you know what? There's some good soil around there. It's not perfect. But I'm going to throw this in there. Take care of that. And then he gets to a part of the field, man, it's just black. I mean, Florida, Everglades muck that they want to turn into waterway. Amen. Got political there for a second. <laughs> Amen. But, man, that's, that's, that's our bread and butter, baby. Let me, let me talk to you. That's our bread and butter. That black muck is our bread and butter. That's who we are. That's what we're here for. That helps us be producers. Amen. That's who, come on, do you hear what I'm saying? In pretty much any other industry that's here and you're not in ag, you depend on the ag people to do what you do. AC people, we wouldn't need you if there were no ag people here. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's that soil that's our bread and butter. Amen. 
So he gets to that part of the field, and I think he really, I think he really reached down in his bag when he got to that good soil. I still got some pinto beans left. And he got to that good field. And I, I'm telling you, he said, boy, I know what's going to happen here. Really need to pour it on thick here. Amen. Amen. Nobody come to the altar today and step on a bean. You've got to step around them. And he really poured it on. So he lays down his bag and he looks over what he just did. And he said, man, I know some fell among the road. Let me have my road up there. Some fell on the road. Really, that illustration kind of does it all. But some fell on the road, and the Bible says, I'm not going to read it because of time, but Jesus says, some fell on the road, and immediately the birds came and ate it up. Now, why didn't they eat up the seed that fell in the field? How come they only got the seed that fell on the road? Because listen to me this morning. The seed that fell on the road had no ability to be covered. In other words, he said this, the people that have no covering, the enemy will immediately be able to come and take the word. I don't care if you've got a personal word from Billy Graham himself. If you have no covering over your life, and let me say this, coming to church does not mean you have a covering. Shut the door, turn off the lights, let's go home. Coming to church does not mean you have a covering. A covering means I submit my heart here to be taught, here's the biggie, to be corrected, to be instructed, and to be challenged. No pain, no gain. Amen. So the, the seed on the road has no ability to be covered. But he knew the seed that at least fell in the furrows that he had made out in those fields, he could come along behind it and cover it up. It has a covering. But the road has no furrow. The road is hard. The road is tough. The road is rebellious. The road is stiff-necked. And the road has no ability to be covered. See, a lot of people don't want to hear that. A lot of people don't want to hear that. Because our society today says, you don't need anybody over you. But that's the consumer down on the inside of you talking. As soon as you're challenged, you get your feathers ruffled. But if Jesus is truly down on the inside of your heart, you consider it pure joy when somebody ruffles your feathers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's the flesh, it's the stone, it's the uncovering, it's the rebellion that's being challenged in my life. But a lot of people don't want to hear that. And they go look for a church. They go look for a church, not a covering. I want to find a church where everybody's nice. Oh, they're just so nice. You will go to hell very nice. There will be a lot of nice people in hell. I want to go to a church where they fellowship and everything's so nice. And the music is not loud. And I understand the meaning of the songs. And it's the music that my parents sang and their parents sang and their parents sang. And I just like a good old-timey church. If we're going to change the climate, we've got to stop being churchgoers and start being people that have abilities to be covered. I'm not going to church. I'm going to my spiritual covering. Next Sunday, wake up. You going to church? No, I ain't going to church. Where are you going? What are you doing today? I'm going to my spiritual covering. I'm going to where I'm planted. I'm going to where I have an ability to be challenged and taught. You better be thankful you've got a pastor that's not afraid to preach the gospel of Christ. And preach it hard and preach it true and preach it without apology. 
and preach it passionately. Those men are few and far between. I want to just go where they encourage me and build me up. And You want somebody to love you where you are and not challenge you to go anywhere else. Then some seed fell upon rocky ground. It had the ability to be covered, but it still had some hard places in it. Still has the ability to be covered, but there's some hard places that's going to limit the depth of the roots. And what are the hard places of my life? It's those areas of my life that I have not become Christ-like. Well, that's just who I am. No, that's just an area of your life that you've not run through Calvary. And you are hanging on to it for some reason. Either you like it or you don't think it can change or you get your identity from it. Boy, he's got such a bad temper. You ever seen anybody proud of having a bad temper? Man, I got a bad temper. My grandpa had one. My dad had one. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, every time a seed hits that bad temper, I just wasted a seed. But I'm thankful that God is willing to waste a seed. Now, the Bible says, you said the word of God never returns to him void. Well, that seed did spring up on that rock. Come on, it did work. And it became an indicator that there's something in your life. Maybe that's what God was trying to throw. Hey, how come I can never grow anything right there? And God's saying, every time I throw a word on it, you've not changed. How come I can never grow anything right there? God says, that's a hard place. And my word is working, but it's not producing anything. And it returning, you say, well, it won't return to God without fulfilling what it was sent to do. Well, sometimes it was sent to do nothing but indicate to you there's something there you need to deal with. Sometimes that's God's getting out of his seed what he sent it to do. Man, that was a good word. Hallelujah. I started it a week ago, man, and began to see some growth, but then all of a sudden it just died. Well, it, it's not the word's fault. It's the rock's fault. Let me say that again. It's not the word's fault. It's the rock's fault. Hallelujah. And then the Bible says he threw some seed and it grew among the thorns. It was thorny ground. Somebody say thorny. It was thorny ground. And then when he threw it in there, it began to spring up. The seed worked. Somebody say it worked. The seed worked. But all of a sudden, the thorns and the weeds began to choke the life out of that seed. Began to choke it. How does it choke it? Number one, it sucks the nutrients out of the soil that were meant for that seed, that thorny ground, that weedy ground takes that nutrients and it sucks it away from that plant and causes it to be ineffective. Number two, it shades the sunlight off of it. We all need sunlight to grow. And it shades the sunlight. But he says it choked the life out of the seed, out of the plant. And it never produced anything. Never, ever was able to produce. And it's thorny ground. It's weedy ground. But God still threw some seed in there. He still spoke a word over there. He still released his son into that situation. But then the worries, Jesus said, the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. He compared that to the thorns on a plant and the weeds on a plant in a field. To the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of riches choke the life out of that seed. And I began to realize, you know what? As hard as we try, we're not going to be able to get out of this world. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? We're not going to be able to escape this world. It's always going to be here. It's always going to be here. 
And I thought, how do I live in a world that always wants to choke the life out of me and still be productive? And I began to realize the deceitfulness of riches and the worries of this life. The deceitfulness of riches and the worries of this life, of this age, of this world, choke the life out of it. How do I live in a world like that and be productive and be a producer? That means I've got to find, and, and people that, when we succumb to the deceitfulness of riches and the worries of this life, means I've never found my identity in Christ. I always am defined by this world. How many realize the world wants to define this church? Come on. And if we listen to it long enough, we'll succumb to the worries of this life. Oh, they're never going to be able to do anything. If we listen to that long enough, they've been out there a long time, been in that same old building. They've been saying they're going to build a church for many years. It ain't happened. Best they can do is put a portable up. Come on to hear them. Best they can do is put an old portable up. <clears throat> and if we listen to that long enough, it'll become a worry of this life. Is, is God really going to do this? Is, is he going to make it happen? Am I going to be able to see this thing through? And then the deceitfulness of riches. And I believe there's millionaires in this church, but they're not defined by what the world says a millionaire is. How many realize somebody could give a million dollars away and their life not even change? Are they a millionaire? We cannot be defined by this world. This world wants to put its, its stamp and its symbolism and its terminology on us. But we've got to rise to another level. Amen? Amen? I've got to be defined by something else. Who defines you? What defines you? And the people that really have power over you are the people that you listen to. The definitions that you really stamp on your life. I declare to you today, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's heaven's definition of you. It's got to be broken. Somebody say broken. It's got to be broken. And I'm running out of time. I got five minutes left. But some seed fell among good soil. And it produced some 30, some 60, and some 100. What was sown in that field? It was good soil. And we look at it like four different people. But Jesus wasn't saying that. He wasn't saying there's, there's road people, there's rocky people, there's thorny people, and there's good people. So we don't go up here and say, oh, I'm a, immediately Christendom says, oh, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm, a, I'm pure good soil. He wasn't saying that. He was saying one person can manifest all of this. Come on, there's been times in my life I've been a road person. Oh, I don't need no covering over my life. I'm a, I'm, I am my own pastor, preacher, po apostle, and prophet. I am fivefold Mark Murphy to myself. You hear what I'm saying? You don't need a covering. I've been there. I've been here. I've had stuff in my life that I know had not been regenerated through the cross. I've been here. I let people define me. People would say, man, you're... You're, man, you got this going on for you. And you believe the press, but it wasn't what heaven said about you. And then I've been here. I've received the word. I knew things were right. I received it. I took it, and I've seen God do some powerful things through my life. I've had all four of them. I want you to stand with me this morning. And I'm going to close with this thought. See, a lot of people to step out into Christendom are looking for the situation to be right, the circumstances to be right. They're not to be any trouble. They're not to be any challenge. It's never going to happen. A lot of people are looking to be a climate changer. They're looking for the same thing, the conditions to be right, the circumstances to be right, the money to be right, the people to be right. 
the right timing. I know I'm going to get the right response. How many have ever tried to wait to go ask for forgiveness? Man, I think that person's right. You better go. It's not about what they may do or not do. You better go and release it and get that out of your heart and out of your life. But we're all looking for these perfect circumstances and situations. And the Holy Spirit shared this with me. I began to think about Adam in the garden. And the Bible said, and God said to Adam, and he said, you're able to partake of every tree, but the tree that's in the middle of the garden, you cannot eat or you'll die. How many realize that was not on day one? All of that, the fall and everything did not happen on day one. And Adam was assigned and mandated with the task to take care of the garden. And that's all of it. That's all of it. Somebody say, that's all of it. So apparently he had to take care of the tree that possessed the ability to kill him. Somebody say, that's maturity. That's maturity. He had to prune it. He had to pull the weeds around it. Of course, there were no weeds back then. But he had to clean up around it. The old dead rotten fruit he had to throw away. He had to take care of that tree. If the limb was broken, he had to prune it. Come on, you hear what I'm saying? And that tree produced the ability to kill him if he ate it. But he had to take care of it. And I began to realize that when you truly truly find your identity in Christ, you can take care of your enemy, the person that has the ability to cause you the most harm. But you can't do it just because the Bible says so. There must be something down on the inside of you that says, God, I need to go to another level. I need to go to another place. I'm not going to be defined by this world. The world says I need to get revenge. But the cross says I need to forgive and love my enemies. Somebody say amen. Come on, lift your hands all over this place. All over this place today. Where are you? You may be all four today. But where are you? Are you challenged today at the thought If I'm coming to church, but I know I'm not under a spiritual covering, is that you? You need to get your hands up and say, God, today I'm coming under under a covering. I've been coming to church, but I'm not covered. That's why I'm not producing anything. Do you have some things in your life today that you know are not Christ-like? And for years you've said, yeah, but I got some good soil. I'm producing some things over here. But God says, you know what? I'm continually letting those crop failures on that hard place to let you know I want it dealt with today. Do you have some things in your life that are not Christ-like? Thirdly, have you let the world define who you are in Christ? Have you let the world define who you are in this life? Are you full of worry? Are you full of trying to grab a hold of a prize that the world says, if you get this, you'll have fame and power. People will love you and they'll adore you. You'll be famous. Is that what you're after? If so, you'll never produce. Because eventually the world's going to come down and it's going to come down hard. You cannot be a climate changer and a world lover. You've got to find your identity in Christ. And do you want to move over here? into the field of good soil. Come on, if that's you, just lift your hands. I don't know where you're at today. Only you and the Holy Ghost know. But I know there's some people in here. You've been coming to church. And when I said the word covering, you didn't even know what it was. You didn't even know it existed. But I'm telling you something. There's a place where you say, God, you put a man over my life. You put leadership over my life. This is not just a church and a program. This is a living, breathing organism with structure and with order, and I need to plug myself into where I need to be. I need a covering. I'm tired of being a consumer. I need a covering today. Do you have some hard spots? I almost want to give an altar call for this one. Do you have some hard spots that God's been throwing some seed on just to let you know it ain't going to work? It ain't going to work until you deal with that hard spot. It ain't going to work. You got some hard spots you need dealt with today. The Holy Ghost is here to deal with hard spots. I just feel that strongly. But the devil's sitting on your shoulder saying, yeah, but you got some good ground in there too. Don't worry about that hard spot. But God says, I didn't save you to 
keep a few hard spots around. I saved you to produce some hundred, some sixty, and some thirtyfold. I'm not satisfied. Any farmer, any sower worth his salt is not satisfied unless he's got a hundred percent. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, Holy Ghost. Lifting my hands, God, Father God, Father God, Father God, Abba Father, I give you access to my hard places today. I bring them to the cross. I bring it to the cross today in Jesus' name. Bring that hard place to the cross. Only thing that can handle it is the cross. Only thing that can change it is the cross. Holy Ghost, Father God. How many want to change from being a consumer to a producer? You're tired of complaining. You're tired of hanging out with consumers. I want to change crowds. I want to move into the producers. I want to hang out with them people that find answers to situations. I want to hang out with those people that rejoice over problems because they realize it's just an opportunity to outproduce the problem. There's no problem I cannot outproduce in Jesus' name. today I thank you for your grace thank you for your mercy today thank you for this time in the house of the Lord in Jesus name pray the word of God go like a go like a fire go like a sword burn cut reveal but it needs to be revealed today in Jesus name oh in Jesus name in Jesus name and everybody said amen Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together for the Lord today. Father, we bless you today. Thank you, Lord.